We welcome you to another edition of Being Well Informed. My name is Claudia Barber, and I am your host of this podcast and YouTube television program where we discuss various topics. And of course, today is no exception. Our host uh, is, uh, my, I'm the host again, and uh, our broadcast today will focus on the pharmacist before, during, and after COVID. My very fine guest is pharmacist and lawyer, Hilda Shirley, and author, I should say renowned author as well. Welcome to Being Well Informed. Thank you so much for coming. Hello, 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 Thank Ms. Hilda. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's... Um, it's good to share uh, uh, what we know and what we don't know because our program again is called Being Well Informed. And I am excited to be talking today about uh, the pharmacy industry and where, where, what, your, what the role has changed in the pharmacy industry uh, since uh, COVID. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about yourself and how you chose pharmacy. Okay, well, I guess I initially chose pharmacy because of a love of chemistry. Um, I went to the famous or infamous, depending on how you look at it, Eastside High School in Paris, in New Jersey. And I had some um, good teachers there, one of whom was Miss Moss, who um, turned me on to the subject of chemistry. And I wanted to do something that was related to it as a major and ended up um, deciding on pharmacy uh, because it was a way to apply um, biochemistry and, and physics to physical systems and make it something that was actually um, usable um, and that I could earn a living doing. So um, that's how I got interested in, in pharmacy. But you also have uh, been in the role of counsel. Yes. Uh, you are an attorney, licensed attorney. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that combination is very interesting. It is an interesting combination. I have spent um, a total of maybe 20, 21 years um, in various positions as counsel um, in various industries and with government and about eight years or so in pharmacy leadership um, positions with pharmacy organizations, healthcare systems primarily. Yes. And so you're, but now you're, you're in the role of pharmacy again? Yes, sort of, kind of. Um, my, my position, I report to the general counsel and um, certainly would not have the job if we're, I were not a lawyer, but what um, drew my general counsel to me actually was the fact that I was both a pharmacist and a lawyer and having been the person, you know, behind the counter and having been the person with the pharmacy experience and the pharmacy operational experience, um, it's helpful um, if, if your role is to um, help the pharmacist to operationalize the legal requirements, which is which is what I do. Um, it's helpful to understand the operational aspects of pharmacy. It is helpful to understand a pharmacist's sense of professional responsibility. I think that's something that lawyers often miss. And to have kind of a um, different perspective on um, how pharmacy is regulated, how state boards of pharmacy interact with pharmacists, um, and so I kind of have a dual perspective that really helps me enjoy my job. How did the role of pharmacists actually change uh, during COVID? Um, I think it changed quite a bit. Um, it had always been um, the role of the pharmacist to ensure proper storage, you know, and, and drug supply to make sure the prescriptions are appropriate, you know, um, no issues with drug interactions, with um, disease state interactions. It's always been the pharmacist's job to call the doctor and say, hey, listen, you wrote a prescription for drug X. Do you know this person is on drug Y or has disease state Z? Because um, often you, the patient, have not shared that with your doctor for whatever reason, didn't know it was relevant. Um, you know, what have, have my eye drops got to do with my antidepressant? Well, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's something that didn't get mentioned um, when you were at your psychiatrist. And so the pharmacist is kind of there um, to be that person to pick up on those things and notice them 
Um, we spend a lot of time on the telephone talking to doctors, um, you know, about doses, you know, about tablet versus capsule, you know, about alternative therapy, something other drug in the same therapeutic class, meaning it does the same thing um, as this maybe um, does it in a different way. And so um, providing patient care and um, support for other healthcare professionals, usually in the form of um, making available, um, reliable, and um, easily accessible information to both patients and to other healthcare professionals like doctors. So where were pharmacists at always administering vaccines before the pandemic? Um, they had been for many years, um, and that's been regulated by state law. And so states vary quite a bit um, in how they regulated the administration of, of vaccines. So um, in some states, you know, you, you might have to get certified, you know, take some additional course or something and get certified to um, vaccinate. You might um, have been limited, you know, by age. Maybe you could, a pharmacist can only administer um, a vaccine to people over the age of 12 or over the age of 18, um, maybe only certain vaccines. And so, yes, pharmacists had been um, administering it, vaccines um, for many years, and um, it was not consistent across states, you know, just the scope of the pharmacist's authority to administer those vaccines. So during COVID, did all, any of that change? Yes, that changed quite a bit, um, largely in response to a lack of access um, to the vaccine and a lot of, um, well, lack of information too. Um, there was a lot of vaccine hesitancy um, with people, you know, not really understanding, you know, how this could happen so quickly, you know, distrust of the government, you know, people, I'm not gonna believe the government, I'm not gonna believe what the CDC says, I don't believe what the FDA says. Um, I may not trust my doctor even to not be a part of the conspiracy. And so here are these pharmacists, you know, right there in the community, one of the most trusted professionals um, and also um, very well educated, very well trained. When I went to pharmacy school back in the 80s, it was a five year bachelor's program. It's now um, a 66 year um, doctoral program. So you have a very knowledgeable person out there um, who's really, really grossly underutilized. And so um, at federal level, some decisions were made um, that kind of broadened um, the responsibility of pharmacists in this area. Um, one of those changes was um, making um, the authority to vaccinate the law across the country, regardless of what your state law um, had said about it, you were now empowered um, pharmacists and also pharmacists could um, initiate this. You didn't need a, a physician to write an order saying vaccinate this person. The pharmacist could do that and either the pharmacist or pharmacy intern um, could go ahead and administer the vaccination and, um, you know, even set up, feds even set up a program. Um, and that program um, provided um, free vaccine to certain selected pharmacy chains um, and uh, you really utilize the pharmacist um, to kind of distribute not only information, but also to, um, you know, to, to distribute vaccine to them and to make it avail available to the community. Um, so that was one of the really big ways in, in which um, the, the, the role of pharmacists change. Now, I remember during the pandemic, Mm -hmm. There were specific vaccines that were the go-to vaccines. There was the Pfizer, there was the Moderna. Then there was the Johnson & Johnson, one and you're done. So yeah. whatever happened to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, will it continue or is it just gone forever? It's still out there. It is still available under the emergency use authorization. It is just not recommended for most people. Um, if, you know, you are allergic to the other vaccines or to some ingredient in the vaccine, it's not recommended um, that you get the J&J &J or, or Janssen vaccine, but it is um, still available. It's just not a first line vaccine. There were some issues 
Um, you know, early on, it only affected a small number of people, but it was enough, you know, to cause enough concern to say, we'll take this one, you have to, if the others are not available, um, it's probably going to be better than nothing for you. I see. So it's sort of a, a secondary as opposed to a first choice vac- right. vaccination. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, where are we? Because I've lost track in terms right. of, of the first uh, COVID vaccine, uh, mm-hmm. and then the Moderna and the Pfizer had the two-step, but then there were boosters. So are we on the fourth booster or the third booster? Where are we on this? Yeah, we, we, we had the first two and then we had the first booster. Now we're on the, the fourth booster. It's, it's a different formulation um, than the original boosters where we had the original monovalent um, vaccines and, and those were active against the original um, virus. And then we have the sort of um, second generation um, bivalent um, versions of both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And those are active against the most prevalent strains of Omicron in addition to the original coronavirus. And so um, the original booster is, is pretty much fallen off with the recommendation being that no one get those anymore um, and that everyone get these kind of second generation um, versions instead. Um, and then there's another one um, called Novavax as well. Um, it became available earlier this year, and it's a, a monovalent, kind of an, an, an old school um, COVID-19 um, vaccine, works a little um, more like our traditional vaccines have worked, meaning that you're actually getting um, a piece of the virus that um, is, is being used to sort of trigger um, a reaction so that your body produces um, antibodies and is better prepared to fight off infection should you get it exposed. And that's available, you know, for the, the original two dose vaccination, but also is available as a booster dose if you haven't um, already gotten a booster dose, you know, of the Pfizer or Moderna booster. Now, you said that came out this year in 2022. Yeah. So it sounds like it'll be around for 2023. Likely, yes. <laughs> okay. So oftentimes uh, customers obtaining vaccines from pharmacies are asked about health insurance. Mm-hmm. Are COVID vaccines free or built through insurances on file? The vaccine is free to the patient. Um, what the pharmacist or doctor or clinic can do is um, get reimbursed a fee for administering from your insurance company. And that's whether it's a private insurance company or public insurance like Medicaid or Medicare, um, they can get an administration fee from the insurance company. Uh, That's why they ask for your your information, but um, there's no out of pocket to you. So there's no out of pocket for for the individual patient, uh, but um, to the extent that People have, let's say, Medicare coverage mm-hmm. or Medicaid. Does it impact their their um, their bill in any way? Um, no, they they don't pay out of pocket either. It's it's whether it's per- private or public in- insurance. It's still pretty much handled in the same way. Well, you know, there's just so much um, about the booster shots also that is new, and it could and it seems to be developing uh, mm-hmm. as you go along uh, because. Oftentimes, people uh, have questions about, okay, now, how do we know that this booster shot is good? Mm -hmm. Or how do we know that this booster shot is effective? And another question might come up about the children Mm -hmm. that are getting a respiratory virus, and Mm -hmm. is there a shot available for them? Um, the short answer is yes, they're about as safe as any other product that's out there on the market. Um, and, you know, the, the issue with the children, you know, any kind of reaction in a child or adult, um, even with adults, you know, the suggestion that you stick around for a while after you've had your shot is so that they can, you know, address any issues that occur immediately, like an allergic reaction or something that they can take care of right, take care of right there and then. But, but, you know, yes, we certainly can treat any, you know, un, unwanted effects of, of the virus that might occur as a result of the administration. 
do you do you think that the Omicron variant of the COVID-19 disease, is that still threatening or spreading or are shots available still for the for that particular variant? Yes and yes. <laughs> it's still out there and it is still spreading. And um, the um, sort of um, second generation of booster shots um, has been shown to be effective against those two. The, the um, Novax um, booster, I understand, has not been uh, made to target the Omicron, but um, the manufacturer assures us that, you know, it is nevertheless effective for some strains of the Omicron um, form of the virus as well. So then there's also the, the, the children. Mm -hmm. um, I know that I'm sure there are parents mm -hmm. that have children of mm -hmm. all ages, mm -hmm. but the ones that um, are not able to take vaccines, let's say an infant that's trying, that mm -hmm. gets COVID. I mean, what response or, or uh, does, the, does the pharmacy role have in, in uh, that situation? Yeah, in that case, that you know, child definitely needs to be under a doctor's care in that instance. Um, the um, boosters are not appropriate for um, children of that age. And so, um, you know, if you're in that situation, you've got a child and you've got some concerns, um, certainly discuss that with your doctor and, um, you know, get some advice as to how best to protect your child. So, so what is the age where uh, vaccines are available for children? Um, the Pfizer is 12 and older. Okay. Um, the Moderna is 18 and up. So, you know, that's kind of adults only, but uh -huh. so for, for children under 12, yeah. And, you know, some doctors might, you know, say, okay, I think the, the risk here is outweighed by the, the benefit and, you know, might want to vaccinate your child. Um, you know, under that doctor's care, they, they might be comfortable with it if the parent is comfortable with it. But the, the indication um, is 12 and older for the Pfizer and 18 and up for the Moderna. So for clarity purposes, mm -hmm. CDC has not uh, identified a vaccine for children under 12. For, for the booster, not that I am aware of. Okay. What about the original shot? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm... Um, rusty on <laughs> the age limits for those. Okay. Yeah, but there were age limits on that as well. Um, my daughter, who was 17, was not able to get the, the Pfizer, for example. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and then there, there are also um, other considerations, you know, as, as well, such as, um, you know, whether a person is already vulnerable, what their age is. Um, all of those things um, go into a doctor's advice. If you've got a special situation, you know, whether or not you should be considering getting um, either or any of the vaccine boosters. What supply chain issues happened during the pandemic? You know, from, um, of course, there were shortages of supplies, you know, um, even things like vials and stoppers and things like that. Um, I understand a lot of the problem with, with the manufacturer um, getting it packaged. Um, from the pharmacy perspective, it just looked like delays um, with product coming you know, from the federal government to the state and maybe some difficulty just figuring out how to allocate the product. Um, and so it was difficult for us on the pharmacy side, because we we never knew how much product we were going to have available, so it was very difficult to plan. Um, I think that the uh, vaccine was frozen kind of um, through the um, profession for Elite Two. We had to rush out and and um, you know sort of procure um, the necessary freezer storage space in order oh, okay. to obtain the vaccine because we had not been faced with that before. You know, pharmacies had freezers, of course but um, nothing of the magnitude that we were going to, to need to, to handle the situation, especially um, a health, healthcare system like the one I was with that was really out there in the community, uh, making sure that people got vaccinated. It wasn't just for our patients. And so, um, you know, it, it was slow in coming. I think part of the problem too is um, some felt that we really needed a national effort here. Mm -hmm. And the way vaccines are usually handled is, you know, the federal government provides it to the state and then the states provides it to the localities or directly to the providers or however they want to do it. 
And so, um, you know, you're, you're giving out virus at federal level based on the head count and then states aren't utilizing them in the same way. You know, some are um, trying to hold some back and have it available over time. You know, some states had more success than others in getting people to get a second dose. You know, And so they're running out more quickly than, than other states were. So it was just kind of a mess, you know, at the outset um, with, with, you know, everybody just kind of learning what they were doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would imagine so, because the pandemic, it's like it just took a nature of its own and and people had, to, I guess, to conform. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but there were just so many tragic deaths during that time period when the vaccine was not available. Yes. So it seems like to be to be having some impact now mm -hmm. that vaccines are available. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot more vaccines are available than people are actually <laughs> taking advantage of. Okay, so that's important. So yeah. there are, I guess people feel that because the pandemic has slowed down in terms of deaths, that maybe I don't need a booster shot. I guess, are, are they getting booster shots at, a, at a, a high rate? What I have seen is ranges from like 12 to 14% of the mm. U.S. are getting booster shots. With um, the seniors, it's you know closer to around 31%. Um, which is not high. And I, mm -hmm. I do think that, you know, part of it is that people are just kind of over it and um, really kind of in denial, you know, we want it to be over. So we're kind of, right. That. Right. so right. people are still being hospitalized and people are still dying. But generally, um, I think we're still seeing a milder disease and people are, are saying, well, I'll just take my chances because, you know, it's so burdensome to have to be wearing um, this mask and we're tired of social distancing. And if we get sick, we just get sick and we'll get over it and move on. I see. So I, how has the state's involvement during the pandemic uh, in administering vaccines changed? You know, I don't think their role has changed. I just checked my um, state's site um, <laughs> last night. I don't know that the role has changed that much, particularly, you know, from the, the pharmacy perspective. I think they've just learned how to do it better mm -hmm. um, than, than they had in the past. I think um, people have more gotten the hang of it now. You know, do I, I how do I need to plan, you know, and yeah. how many people can I reasonably expect are going to get a dose and then are going to come back for that next dose? But surely at the beginning of this, the I guess the pharmacists were serving maybe hundreds versus thousands versus hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Of yeah. Yeah. And over time, you know, just kind of ebbed and flowed, you know, that there's usually this, you know, kind of initial frenzy with the um, sort of first adapters to people who are saying, yes, I want my shot now, you know, I'm, I'm not going to hesitate. And then, um, so you see this kind of uptick and then, you know, I guess it just kind of goes down to a trickle. <laughs> So was the pharmacy industry underutilized, you think, during the pandemic? And will this change going forward? I think uh, certainly before the pandemic, the, the pharmacy profession was under underutilized. Um, going forward, I am hopeful that the changes that were made as a result of the, the pandemic will continue. I am hoping that states who were really restricting um, the ability of pharmacists to, um, you know, work at the top of their license and to fully utilize their education and training and skills. I'm hoping that state laws will change to allow that to continue. That's wonderful. I think that the um, uh, the this whole COVID uh, pandemic and the role of the pharmacists is something that is ongoing in terms of changing. Uh, do you anticipate more booster shots or no? I am gonna guess that it'll be pretty much like the flu. I mean, we're seeing it now with this um, second round of boosters, we've got something that is more targeted to the um, bug that is currently ailing us. And that happens every year with flu vaccine, but we still call it flu vaccine but it's a different formulation each year um, based on what strains of the flu virus that you know, we anticipate will be um, most prominent, most troublesome. And so it's changing all the time. That is not unusual. 
Um, you know, it's it it's um, seems like a big deal, you know, because COVID's so high profile. You know, the, the flu vaccine is quietly changed every year, and you know, nobody's talking about it. It's just not a big deal, and I think that's what it will come to. We'll we'll have um, various versions of the vaccine um, each year. Probably, we're going to have to say, okay, which strains are we going after this year? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And you think that um, more than likely, uh, will there be uh, more vaccines coming for children under 12 or um, that that is still being explored? Definitely. Um, I definitely think that um, we'll see something available for small children eventually. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of, you know, further testing and um, you know, just making sure that we've got a product out there that's going to do more harm, more good than harm. Well, you know, one question I often had, um, or that may come to to mind when the word vaccine is used, mm -hmm. um, they're clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So, can you walk us through the process as to how a vaccine becomes eligible to be used in the market? Yeah, usually it's a. a it's a process that takes several years because, um, you know, there's the, the research and the development of the product. And then, you know, when you think you've got a product, you test that product on people who are not sick, you know, whatever the, the drug is, um, you know, might be for a particular ailment. You test it on folks who don't have that ailment because you're really testing for safety rather than efficacy of the drug. And then you test it on people who actually have the illness. Um, before it, it actually hits the market. So, um, you know, thousands of people have tried it. And the same was true with, with this vaccine as well. Mm -hmm. um, the process was kind of condensed, but it had, you know, gone through um, a, a great deal of testing and more testing, in, in fact, than many of the drugs that are on the market. Um, and so, yes, it's a process that usually takes a number of years and it's a process that was shortened um, significantly with covid um, but you know that that you know process of gathering information continues. It uh, continues as of today. So yeah. do you think that uh, uh, the prospects look looks bright for people who are with child if they're pregnant? Mm -hmm. Are there vaccines for those that are carrying children? Yes, people. It's, it's already recommended. You know that pregnant women get vaccinated. I know there was a rumor out there that it causes causes problems. Um, I would definitely suggest that people, you know, check with their physician in their particular case, um, you know, and make sure that there aren't any any circumstances that would make it inadvisable in their case. But uh, yeah, I think we're there already today. So that's a good thing. Absolutely, yeah. So vaccines are available for those who are pregnant, mm -hmm. and it looks like more than likely. Boost, booster shots will still be part of our our history and part of our getting through this pandemic. I suspect it's gonna, yeah, just become a fact of life. <laughs> so just like your flu shot, um, you know, some people will take it, some people will not. Um, but I think we'll be at a point where enough people will take it. You, you know that that it will be very helpful to us you know, to, to prevent, um, you know, a larger societal problem. Um, I don't know um, that COVID will ever, you know, be as much of a concern again. I think that we're we're doing a good job at this point of getting it under control. But I, it, I don't think we're going back to the old normal. <laughs> right. Uh, the old normal. So the question is, is the pandemic over? I don't think it's over. No, um, I think that it's slowed to a point where we've reached a certain comfort level. But when I say I don't think there'll ever be, you know, the old normal, I think that this pandemic has changed us in ways, you know, it's changed the way that we work, you know, it's changed the way that we live. Um, and and I don't think that those things are, are necessarily going to change. I think we're, we're, um, Ir irreversibly changed in some ways. Ir irreversibly changed. Even the mask wearing, I still see people today wearing yeah. masks at funerals, at, uh, you know, uh, family gatherings, at, um, you know. Airplanes. Yeah. And I carry a mask. If I see someone wearing a mask, I think, well, maybe that person's vulnerable. 
you know, and trying to protect themselves. And so if I see, you know, somebody around me is wearing a mask, I will probably put my on, mine on because they might be wearing that for a reason. Right. And sometimes when people are next to you on a plane, you can't, you know, they can't control <laughs> it when you, you can't control when they're going to cough, right. cough on you. Right. You know, mm-hmm. and so that to me, it's just smart to mm-hmm. wear a mask, even uh, when you're traveling by air, especially on a plane. I do. So, yeah. And and so, you know, that I gather that, you know, that trend is changing. But I, I think that hopefully mask wearing is something that uh, is um, is good for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I thank you so much. You have been so helpful in getting us, uh, 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 you know, uh, enlightened more about the role of pharmacy. And I just really appreciate your, um, you know, uh, participation on our podcast and program. Thank you again, Hilda Gurley. Thank you.